1998 marks a very special year in the history of the British motor industry because it's the 50th anniversary of Land Rover, a unique British institution and a name that is literally known around the world. From those very early days in the 1940s when Rover Company was desperate for steel and the only way of getting it was to make a vehicle that would export readily to the present day where the latest 50,000 pound Range Rover is a major hit in the United States. Land Rover has been a British success story. In post-war Britain, car manufacturers struggled to get new products to market. Steel shortages were the most serious problem, but aluminium was in large supply, having been used on military aircraft. Maurice Wilkes, chairman of Rover, saw a potential market for a utility vehicle that could be suitable for peacetime rural needs. Using aluminium bodywork, this was seen as a good stopgap product to keep the firm's Solihull factory busy. Launched at the Amsterdam Motor Show on the 30th of April 1948, the new car was hailed a huge success. Easy maintenance was an important feature, complete with easy removal of all the body panels. And right from the start, some unusual versions were produced. Special military versions were quickly introduced, including the lightweight half-ton model, ideal for parachute drops, and the cab forward design giving a larger payload. Land Rovers were used by the armed forces of over 140 countries worldwide. By the late 1960s, Land Rover was doing research in America, noting the emergence of off-roaders as a lifestyle accessory. Gordon Lashford and Spen King took the concept and developed the idea that was to revolutionize the off-road market. The Range Rover was launched on June 17, 1970. It earned Land Rover a Design Council Award and has even been exhibited at the Louvre in Paris as an example of modern sculpture. By the mid-80s, Land Rover products were overtaken in the sales charts by lifestyle off-roaders like the Shogun from Japan. But by combining teams of engineers and designers and production engineers, Land Rover produced its own rival from concept to launch in 30 months. Launched on September the 9th in Paris, the Discovery was a huge success, quickly outselling its nearest Japanese rival by 3 to 1 in the UK. By now, the Range Rover was over 20 years old. Still being an icon, Land Rover took a conservative route with the replacement. The new Range Rover was launched to the press in August 94. To complete the lineup and compete head on with a new wave of Japanese SUVs, Land Rover came up with the Freelander. With a unitary monocoque chassis, a first for the Land Rover range, and its unique hill descent system, the Freelander looks set to take the lead in its chosen market. 
from a stopgap model in 1948 to the Freelander of 1998, Land Rover has grown beyond all expectations. It now has a strong model range and a reputation that rivals Covet. And the story is set to continue. And that's how the whole thing started. Now, one man who lived that history, Mr. Rover, A.B. Smith. Well, what did you think when that first Land Rover prototype appeared? Do you think you'd ever sell many? Certainly, uh, Morris Wilkes was keen to keep the Jeep going. And it always seemed to me that it was easier, became easier to put an end Rover engine in, a gearbox and axles, uh, to, to put it on one of our own made frames rather than try and keep mucking about with the original Jeep. Engineering, of course, has always been at the heart of the Land Rover product. Former engineering director, now 82, Tom Barton. Oh, I'm very proud. This has been a marvellous show today. I've realised something that I started is still going on. Evolution takes place, of course, and things are improving. Yes, uh, and I've had a marvellous life with the Land Rover, several times around the world, talking to over in over 100 different countries, getting army orders in lots of places. In fact, in the middle of the 75, we were dealing with about 147 armies and police forces. You, so so uh, when you, you look back to that original sort of Jeep-based prototype, did, did you think all this would start? No, I didn't. I was, like the management, I thought it was only a stopgap for two or three years. I didn't think the farmers would want these vehicles like like they was thinking that, uh, and um, I thought yes we should sell some but it would be a small kind of production and I thought it might die and in fact market research did tell us four by four vehicles would die and, and unless we did something to make them better more comfortable and that's why the Range Rover was produced. The launch of the Range Rover was a key moment in Land Rover history Jeff Miller was project engineer. As Land Rover engineers, we, we always felt that we couldn't make a vehicle too comfortable across country. Um, people would go too fast and lose control. We had uh, driven some of the American vehicles and tried this, uh, and we confirmed our worst fears, although, of course, American vehicles were very underdamped in those days. But when we got towards Range Rover, we, we could see with uh, suspension technology as it was then that uh, Spen particularly could see that we wanted uh, more supple, longer travel suspension, uh, which could take us comfortably across country, uh, but with, with proper control. So, Peter, 50 years of Land Rover and the 50-50 challenge. What's it all about? Well, it's about a group of people that work for Rover getting together and thinking what, what can we actually do on this platform of Land Rover's 50th birthday to celebrate 50 years. And what the team have come up with is the idea of trying to travel through 50 countries in 50 days, a completely new record. How did you work out that that might be a good thing to do? Did you look at the Atlas and think that's possible? or We actually brainstormed a whole raft of things. We thought about 50 landmarks and, and various other things, but having sort of evaluated these, we thought that 50 countries, 50 days was something that, you know, hadn't been done before and it sounded like a great challenge to do. It certainly is unique. I've never heard of that before. Julie, you better take us through the geography of this. Where are you starting? Where are you hoping to end up? Well, we start at Land Rover's hometown of Solihull. Um, we take our way all the way through Western Europe firstly, up to North Cape, back down through Eastern Europe, through the Middle East and we eventually end up in South Africa having gone through from Kenya down to South Africa itself and we end up at South Cape so we do North Cape to South Cape taking in those 50 countries. Wow and who chose the route? How did you get the route decided? <laughs> the route's been done by the logistics team which is one of um, five teams that are within our overall large team um, and the main reason for actually sorting it out was we got to hit all those 50 countries and leave ourselves just a couple spare in case we can't cross any borders. So we had to look at the 50 countries and then work our way through them in the most economical route possible. 
So logistically, Peter, how are you doing it? How many people? How many cars? How does it work? OK, well, we've got a team of 30 very dedicated people. Those 30 people are broken down, as Julie's already mentioned, into task teams to kind of break the whole project up into manageable lumps. And we have people that are looking at sorting out the abilities of the people within the team, training them to the, all the right levels. So we've got uh, police driving instructors giving us advanced driving instruction to make sure we're up to that sort of level. We're having to do things like first aid training in case the worst happens. So all those sorts of things are taken into account. We have other people like Julie looking at logistics and logistics is a massive problem because you imagine going through 50 countries, you've got all those borders to go in and out of every time. So that, that in itself is a challenge. Um, we also have uh, a group of people looking at the engineering of the vehicle. The vehicle we're in now is actually a standard vehicle which has been donated to the project by the company. The team actually have to go away and convert this now with roll bars at rated springs to take all the load. In the back we'll have a big cage to keep all of our kit secure. Roof, we'll have roof racks, we'll have spotlights in the roof. A lot of work to do yet, so the teams are broken down into groups that can actually get on and do that. Excellent. Simon, uh, who's driving, we'll have a word with the driver. Uh, how are you getting the money together for this? Well, at the moment we're uh, approaching Land Rover suppliers, mainly for Freelander, to see if they will uh, help us raise money through sponsorship. Um, and one of our main aims through the project is to actually raise a considerable sum of money for charity. What sort of charities will benefit? Uh, we're looking to support UNICEF at the moment. Peter, how much money are you looking for and how difficult is it to raise money? Well, first of all, it's actually very difficult to raise money. You can imagine that there are all sorts of people trying to raise money for worthwhile charities, and we could just be seen to be yet another one of those. But we're actually looking towards raising money and giving it to people that look at long-term futures. So we're not looking at just giving a wad of money away. With regards to how much money we're raising, uh, it's a lot. We're talking uh, a very substantial six-figure number here. And if you imagine, for instance, that when we come to ship the vehicles back from South Africa, at the moment, we're looking at £4,000 a car, and that's when we finished it. So you can imagine that we're looking at a lot of money indeed. Well, Julie, it's not just a matter of being able to drive the huge distances involved and cross all those borders in 50 days, but you've also got to live together and like each other for a long time, haven't you? How's that going to be? That's right. We seem to have done all right so far. We've had uh, numerous team-building events, social evenings, um, trying to get to know each other as, as a big team. Um, that team will be broken down into smaller elements as we're doing the driving, um, three people per car, and then we'll swap around between each leg, uh, each leg of the journey. So we know each other pretty well. How well we'll know each other towards the end is another thing. <laughs> Let me go back to Simon who's uh, driving. Have you ever driven in the sorts of conditions that you'll be faced with and from the very northern part of Europe right down to South Africa? Um, I've driven across into Europe and various parts of Europe but certainly not into the, uh, the less hospitable climes like uh, northern Europe and down into Africa. But uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge and hopefully with the training that we're receiving we'll be up to that challenge. Do you think there'll be much off-roading needed from the Freelander? Um, certainly not in Europe, I wouldn't have thought, but you can never rely on roads in, in the less developed countries, um, so we shall, we'll have to wait and see. It's always a good idea to actually uh, equip yourself with the training and the skills that you need to actually do that. At this moment, what's your biggest fear for the journey? Um, Sorry, Tom. <laughs> excuse me a moment. Finding the right way, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie, what about personally? What are you going to get out of this trip? Something completely different that uh, I've never even thought about trying before. Um, right down from the, the mixing with people through to the actual challenge of, of driving the vehicles themselves. It'll be quite an exercise in life, wasn't it? Something you'll never forget. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and uh, no, not only will we not forget the actual project itself but the great thing is that the people who have been involved with this project have already done things that they would never normally do. As we've said, uh, we've got police instructors giving us advanced driving, something I would never have normally got the opportunity to do. Also, uh, here I am in front of a television camera, a first for me as well. Uh, we have other firsts for most of the people. Um, they're getting to, to make presentations to Rover Group directors at a level that they would never normally get to do it. So it's a building thing for everybody that's involved with this project. So a lot to be gained for everybody. Well, we wish you luck over the next two months and the next time we see you will be in foreign climes, probably. Good luck to you all. Thank you very much indeed, Howard.
The Freelander has so far been a great success story for Land Rover ever since it was introduced a year ago. But whilst most people go on about attractive packaging and value for money, it was a particular piece of technology of almost anorak proportions that stood out for me. It's called HDC, or Hill Descent Control, and I've come to Rover to find out exactly what it means and how it works. Typically, we're bringing sort of 80% of our customers into Freelander have never had four-wheel drive experience before. And key part of the project was to take the skill out of off-roading so that, you know, anybody coming new to Land Rover could uh, get on and use the capability. So how different is it to our normal experience of off-roading with low ratio gears? OK, well, the best thing I can do is actually start with uh, a conventional product. Uh, take Range Rover, for instance, and show you what's underneath. Excellent. Right, so what have we got here? OK, well, this is underneath of a Range Rover, which is uh, one of our main product lines at Land Rover. And it, the drive line here is laid out in a fairly conventional four-wheel drive fashion. We're starting up here with the, with the engine, but it runs along the length of the vehicle, what we call north-south, which is all up under here. Underneath this cover here is the transmission, the main gearbox. Mm -hmm. And on the back of it, is the unit that we're talking about today, which is the transfer box. Right, now remind us what that does. Okay, the transfer box takes the drive out of the gearbox, which is the thing that gives you your one, two, three, four, five normal uh, gear, gear ratios, puts it into here. First thing it does is split it to put the drive to the front axle and the drive to the rear, which gives you a four-wheel drive. The second thing it does is generate two sets of ratios. So you've got a set of high gears for on-road use and a set of low gears for off-road use. Now this is a piece of known and very successful technology, so what's wrong with it? Why was this not good enough or right for the Freelander? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it, it's perfect application for uh, Range Rover's needs. When we researched uh, typical customers for Freelander, a very new vehicle, and 80% of customers coming into Freelander have had no four-wheel drive experience before. So we did some very thorough research which showed that customers wanted all the necessary four-wheel drive technology we could offer and all the benefits that go with that safety, security, ability to go anywhere, mm. but they didn't want the complicated controls. OK, well, remember what you've seen underneath here and let's step over to the Freelander and see what the difference is. OK. Ah, quite a difference. Mm, well, it... There's very little here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a different application in terms of technology for a very different sort of customer. As I've described to you, we're looking for very simple uh -huh. um, four-wheel drive controls, and that's what this vehicle offers. Um, first of all, very different in that the engine is placed like a front-wheel drive car. It's across the vehicle, what we call east-west. And the gearbox is mounted on the side, and off the back of that is the equivalent of the transfer case. We call it the intermediate reduction drive, and that's basically... It does the same job of splitting the drive, in which case now it goes to the front wheels directly, like a front wheel drive car, and it splits the drive down the prop shaft here to the rear. Oh, I see. So that does the same job as the transfer case. That's right. What it, what it does do is reduces the overall ratios. It takes a five-speed gearbox and drops the overall ratios down slightly. So we have what's called a fairly short first gear. It's a fairly low first gear, but it doesn't have, like in Range Rover, the dual range. It doesn't have a high range and a low range. It has a single range transmission. So what were the sort of problems you had to overcome with the intermediate reduction drive? Well, the intermediate reduction drive gave us great gradeability off-road uh, in terms of going up slopes. Uh, when we first built our early prototypes, which were Maestro vans, hmm. with all of the running gear underneath that you've just seen underneath the vehicle, we took them up to do some serious off-road work and found that it actually exceeded our expectation in terms of being able to go up slopes. The problem we found then is for if people want to do some very serious off-roading, was the ability to offer them something to come down the slope under control, which is what the dual range transmission, the transfer case, gives you. It's this unit here, which is called the ABS modulator, and that's the thing that provides the controlled descent. Well, having built our first prototypes and tried them, it was clearly a good system, we wanted something good. Um, but then we felt we could add some extra dimensions and impart some of the knowledge that we've gained in off-road driving within Land Rover 
to the software controlling the unit. And let me pick an example. If you're going down a slope, and uh, nine kilometers an hour is fine, but if you come across some broken ground, it's probably appropriate to go a little bit slower. So we have the ability to pick up the, the, sense, uh, the sensing of broken ground through the wheel speed sensors into the control unit. It goes, ah, right, we're going over rough ground now because of the change of acceleration. And then that will then check the ABS modulator to slow the vehicle down to about seven kilometers an hour, just giving that little bit of extra control. And bringing the story right up to date, Freelander project director, Dick Elsie. We have suffered from a lack of investment in the, in the, uh, the 1980s, but now, under BMW ownership, they're putting in some like £600 million a year into Rover Group. It is our own money, I mean, it's allowing us to, uh, to feel that money within the business. And a lot of that is, uh, in the, the past four years has gone on Freelander. We spent £450 million on it, and that's what creates top quality world-class cars. I mean, there is a certain entry price into producing world-class cars, and, and now we're able to do that. Did, I mean, when you came up with the concept of Freelander, did you have to convince a lot of skeptics inside Land Rover you could get away from, you know, fourth bridge engineering and huge chassis and great huge axles and differentials and produce something as light as that? Yes, well, I, I was the man who dared to produce a Land Rover <laughs> without a transfer case. Um, uh, very much, it's a, it's a vehicle targeted for a, for an, a whole new market. 80% of the people coming into Freelander are coming out of saloons and estate cars, and they want saloon, estate car feel, performance, the feel of the controls. They don't want complicated four-wheel drive controls. They just want to be able to drive anywhere in it. And that's what we've provided in, in Freelander. It's not, it's not a car. It's a true Land Rover. Rover is a small car company with a modest output. And I can remember after the war when uh, Helen Street at Coventry had been blitzed and S.B. Wilkes came over to look at the shadow factory at Selly Hall, which was a million square feet, and he said, we shall never, ever use a million square feet. But, of course, you've seen how the growth has gone and... Uh, and that now that great solely oil plant is only Land Rover.